Hello, I'm John Stevens. I'm the uh, chairman of the Federal Trust. And I'm talking to the director of the Federal Trust, uh, Brendan Donnelly, about the possibility of a campaign to rejoin the European Union being launched. This is a question that has arisen linked to the difficulties of Boris Johnson and the fact that his loss of credibility uh, could rub off on the credibility of the project with which he is primarily associated. Brendan, do you think that now is too soon to contemplate uh, discussing rejoin? And there seem to be two aspects to this. Firstly, there's the question of the mandate of the 2016 referendum and how long that should be considered to be valid in democratic terms. And then there's the problem, the political problems associated with getting a rejoin campaign going, uh, which seems to be particularly clear in the, in, the, in the fact that neither the Labour Party nor the Liberal Democrats seem willing to undertake this task. Why might that be? I think we've got to differentiate between the Labour Party and the Liberal Democrats. I, I think the Liberal Democrats would be, would be very willing to join in a campaign if it could be mounted um, independently and they could tuck in behind it. Um, the Labour Party um, under Keir Starmer seems to have gone a bit further in the other direction, um, claiming that there's no argument in favour of Brexit. Um, I don't think that people who want to rejoin the European Union should be too put off um, by the position that Starmer in particular has taken. Um, uh, after all, he's been on a number of places on the Brexit chessboard over the past few years. He's got problems within his own party. He's worried about the, the red wall that the Labour Party may not be able to get back. He thinks uh, unless they strike uh, more nationalistic tones on, on Brexit. Um, I certainly don't think that individuals or, or, or organisations that want to lobby and advocate in favour of rejoin um, should be put off by the internal machinations of, of the Labour Party. Uh, as far as the democratic mandate's concerned, well, given the narrowness of the result, the absence of a supermajority, um, the um, lies and fantasy on which the referendum was won, I was always rather doubtful about whether there was a mandate originally, but certainly the mandate has now been discharged. Um, we've left the European Union. We're told by no less an authority than Mr. Johnson um, that Brexit is done and finally done. Um, and therefore, normal democratic rules apply from now on. And if people want to rejoin the European Union, then they're perfectly free to advocate that, it seems to me. One reason given by uh, pro-Europeans in the, in the Labour Party and the, and the Liberal Democrats for not raising the possibility of rejoining the EU is that it is an extraordinarily difficult task now, not least because it seems very difficult to persuade our partners or our ex-partners in the European Union to have us back, that the changes that would be required in the British view of what being in the European Union means, which would be a commitment to ever closer union, for example, or even monetary union or the um, Schengen, all the rest of that, and the fact that it would need to be clear to our ex-partners that there was a real change of, of, of view in Britain and a, and a settled will, cross-party will, that these constitute such large barriers that really any possibility of rejoining in a realistic political timescale doesn't exist. Well, that's um, the view of unright time. It's too early to, to do anything about it. Um, I'm afraid that's uh, always going to be the view of the people who are favourable to the status quo. Uh, to be uh, favourable to the status quo is always to say it's too early to make the case for the alternative. Uh, I don't agree, by the way, that it's um, more difficult um, to make the case for the United Kingdom's uh, wholehearted participation in the European Union. Indeed, I think that psychologically and politically, one of the problems we had over the past 20 years um, was that even the people who thought of themselves as being pro-EU um, often prefaced their remarks by saying, uh, but of course it's not perfect, but of course we need all these changes. Uh, of course, I'm not a federalist. Um, but there's a, a power 
um, uh, in uh, a clear cut, um, a psychologically coherent approach to the European Union, which is to say, yes, it is indeed about ever closer union. It, it's about um, integration. Um, that's what we hope to bring about. Um, and those are good things for the whole of Europe and for this country. I think it was always psychologically rather disorienting to the British public um, to be asked to vote or to support the European Union um, when leading politicians such as David Cameron and John Osborne um, spent so much time criticizing and complaining the very essence of the European Union. Um, I agree with you entirely uh, that it must be on the basis of a, a much more full hearted commitment to the European Union um, that we'll finally rejoin when, whenever we do. Uh, and I also agree that our partners wouldn't want us at the moment. I think in the longer term, they certainly want to have us back, um, but on the basis of, of, a, of a full commitment, not on the basis of full dragging and half-heartedness. The political circumstances in the UK that would need to come about for such a significant shift of opinion to take place does seem to be quite substantial. I mean, we would be discussing the possibility of a, of a really very serious crisis that could be attributed to our not being members of the European Union. Is that conceivable economically, constitutionally, politically in the near future? I think it's entirely conceivable, sadly, and I think all those three elements may be in place. Uh, e economically. Um, every day we hear about new problems, um, particularly for supply chains that are being brought about. The government has been very lucky, um, curiously and tragically, um, in the, the prevalence of the, of the COVID pandemic, um, which has concealed um, quite a lot of the, the economic problems which uh, have been produced by, by Brexit. Um, the constitutional issue is, is very much uh, exacerbated by Brexit in Northern Ireland and in Scotland. Um, important movements of opinion are taking place that may well lead in the foreseeable future, certainly in Northern Ireland and possibly in Scotland, to an amputation uh, of those areas from the United Kingdom. It will be a, a peculiar um, irony if the United Kingdom, which supposedly wanted to regain its sovereignty by leaving the European Union, um, ended up by depriving itself of, of sovereignty um, over its own territorial integrity. And uh, I agree very much with um, what you uh, referred to at the beginning of our discussion, um, that the, the position of Boris Johnson um, encapsulates um, a political crisis that we have, um, not just in his own personality, but in the fact that Brexit was um, erected on and can only be sustained by lies and fantasy. Um, accountability is out of the window. It always seems to me a, a, a rather sick joke um, to be um, uh, lectured on, on the need to have um, uh, political accountability in this country. Uh, when the government that we have has been so eager in its contempt for Parliament to avoid any such uh, accountability. Uh, if Johnson does go as a result, particularly of having lied to the House of Commons, um, I hope and believe that it may reflect badly uh, upon the, um, the whole um, moral background uh, of him, of the Conservative Party and of Brexit. You mentioned Northern Ireland and Scotland. I mean, there are, of course, a number of people who believe that the, the most likely way in which uh, the UK will uh, rejoin uh, the EU is actually in pieces, that it'll be um, via a reunification of Ireland and Northern Ireland, via an independence for Scotland. And certainly on the continent, this also seems to be a, a growing view. I mean, the lack of enthusiasm for engaging uh, with the notion that Britain the UK could rejoin the EU, doesn't seem to be entirely matched by attitudes towards the prospect of a United Ireland or indeed the prospects of an independent Scotland. Uh, do you see this as being a problem for uh, pro-Europeans? That in a sense, um, there needs to be a very serious constitutional crisis in order to bring about a change of heart sufficient to lead to uh, rejoining the European Union. It would be a paradoxical position if that were true, because um, the instability of Northern Ireland and, and Scotland at the moment is, a, is a, a direct consequence of Brexit. 
it should be a pro problem for the Brexiters, not for the pro-Europeans. Um, but I agree um, that there will be some in this country um, who will accuse um, opponents of Brexit uh, of, of hoping um, for a constitutional crisis. Well, I, I can't see that that, that um, can legitimately be laid at the door of the people who want to rejoin. Those are the people who want to head off that constitutional crisis. Uh, I think there is a difference between Northern Ireland and Scotland in this case. Uh, I think um, Northern Ireland, of course, is of great interest to a member state of the European Union, Ireland. And that will colour to a large extent or to a greater extent um, than in the case of Scotland, uh, attitudes of our, our former partners in the EU. Uh, as far as Scotland's concerned, I, I have the impression um, that the, the, the European Union is wanting to tread very carefully because they, they have the, the justified fear um, that if they are seen to intervene, seen to take one side rather than the other, then that could be unhelpful and counterproductive um, and indeed um, further toxify um, the mix of discussion in, in, in Scotland. To what degree is um, the economic uh, outcome of Brexit and, and its impact more important than the constitutional one? How does the balance between the two uh, threats to the current situation in the United Kingdom um, weigh up in your, in your view? And when I'm talking about the constitutional challenge, I'm not just talking about um, Scotland and Northern Ireland, but also the whole question of our political system, um, the um, first past the post electoral system. There's a lot of talk um, among um, people in the Labour Party and the Liberal Democrats that what is needed is a constitutional change in the UK um, before one can address the the issue of rejoining the European Union? Certainly constitutional change in the United Kingdom um, would be desirable in itself um, and might well help the rejoin cause. Um, but I, I don't see the, the two uh, as being different. I think they, they lock into each other very well. Uh, it's only because um, uh, of the first past the post system um, that we have um, on much, much less than 50% of the votes cast, um, such an overwhelming majority in the House of Commons for the Conservative Party. Uh, I certainly don't buy the argument that we've got to postpone all discussion of rejoining um, until all the other problems have been sorted out. Um, they're, they're very much linked to each other and, and shouldn't be seen uh, separately in my view. Isn't this the fundamental problem of the uh, rejoin cause is that uh, those who are most likely to advocate it, um, being in the, in the Labour, Labour Party and the Liberal Democrats and in forming a, uh, a coalition that can remove this government from power, that they are restrained from discussing rejoin because they wish to wait public opinion moving in their direction because of the economic challenges or the constitutional challenges or, or, or whatever. Uh, and that this goes to the heart of how we ended up with Brexit in a way, which is that the reactionary nature of our political culture, reactionary in the sense that it uh, seeks to follow public opinion rather than to frame it. And that the real root cause of the problem is that without advocacy, of rejoin without advocacy of the merits of a, of a European connection, um, you won't get uh, a shift of opinion. That opinion has to be led, it can't be followed in this case, uh, or indeed in any case in a, in, a, in a functioning democracy. And that that's the real root problem, that we have a, a, a fundamentally passive political culture that is reactive to events. And uh, those events are are likely to lead to a disaster before we are able to formulate um, a solution that would be a, a closer engagement and a, um, ultimately rejoining the European Union. And linked to that is a problem of timing for pro-Europeans, because the longer we are outside the European Union, the greater the dangers of economic damage, um, to, whether it be to, the, to our um, industrial base, to the City of London, to um, our uh, creative industries, or to our constitution through potential breakup of the United Kingdom or the, the damage done by the current um, political uh, culture to uh, our democracy and uh, the rule of law and, and, and 
uh, and the rest, that the longer we wait, uh, the greater the damage will be. And, and you the, describe the, the problem. You describe the problem very well and very exactly. Uh, the question is, what's to be done about it? Um, and if you conclude there's absolutely nothing to be done about it, uh, then go off to the Bahamas or, or wherever it is and, and wait for the um, wait for the um, porcelain to be broken. Um, uh, you rightly say um, that re the reactive attitude in, informs too much of British politics. That was particularly true in the Conservative Party um, when um, there was the hope that um, public opinion would switch in favour of Europe it wouldn't be necessary to take a stand within the Conservative Party. Um, but UKIP and the people who were around UKIP concluded 20 years ago um, that it was worth standing up to fight for what they, quite wrongly in my view, but nevertheless, believed in. Um, something similar um, is incumbent, it seems to me, upon re rejoiners. Um, if you take the view um, that British politics is too reactive in its present mode, which I which I absolutely agree with, particularly perhaps in, in the in the in the Labour Party, um, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to try and jerk them out of this complacency um, by advocacy, by um, putting forward the arguments? first at a social and intellectual level, and then you will hope eventually the political cut through will, will follow, or are you going to do nothing? Um, I don't know if or when we will rejoin the European Union. What I do know is that if people don't advocate the cause, if people are deterred from speaking in favour of it, because Keir Starmer says so, because um, um, the, it, it will displease the times, um, then we will never get anywhere. Um, we have an obligation, um, given the problems that you yourself have pointed to, um, to make the case for rejoin. Um, um, I don't think that you can set a date on it. Um, I hope we rejoin by 2030, because if not, we may not have a, a country, um, uh, an intact country, um, to rejoin the European Union. Renan, thank you very much for, for that um, discussion. Um, I think this underlines the importance of the work that we're trying to do at the Trust to uh, make the process of rejoin uh, a subject of debate uh, and to provide the underlining research and detail that is required uh, to make that case effectively. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this uh, video. Um, if so, I hope you will look at our other material at the Federal Trust. And uh, until the next time, Bren, thank you. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this latest video. It's one of a series of videos about Europe, about Brexit, and about the future of the European Union uh, from the Federal Trust. Uh, I would hope that you'll subscribe to our YouTube channel, and then you'll have notifications of future videos, which I hope you'll enjoy uh, as much as perhaps you enjoyed this one.